Acts chapter 3, reading from the New King James tonight. Amen. I didn't know if an angel was walking in the room or something. I didn't know what was going to happen. That was a little scary. Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. Are you ready? Now Peter and John went up together to the temple, the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, and whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms for those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. He's asking for, he's panhandling. How many of you know what a panhandler is? He's begging. He's asking for money. He's asking for a handout. And fixing his eyes on them, expecting to receive something from them, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Would you read that with me? Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Verse 7, he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people that saw him were praising God, and they knew that it was he who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 16, go to verse 16. Skip all the way down. Verse 16, Acts 3, verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, had made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of y'all. It's the southern version. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Move in power. Mark us tonight on this Pentecost Sunday evening. Touch every single man and woman. Touch every boy and girl. Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Would you just invite the Holy Spirit to have his way tonight? Have your way tonight. Oh, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd encourage you to take notes, but I have not furnished you with any handouts on this evening service. Pentecost Sunday which is today, in actual fact, Pentecost Sunday, in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together with one accord. And suddenly, everybody say suddenly. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I hear some wind right now. It is an electric fan, I'm pretty sure. Somebody give him praise. Amen. Get a little bit of air moving in here because otherwise you might be falling out and it wouldn't be the Spirit of God. It would be heat stroke. (laughs) <laughs> well, that, there's, more, there's more air over here. Holy Ghost. I don't know if it's mighty, but it is rushing a little bit. Filled the whole house where they were sitting. I mean, that had to be quite a meeting. Can you imagine being in your home? And it was someone's home. They're in someone's house. They're at a life group. They're at a a small group at someone's house. And to get the full context of what's taken place, Jesus had been crucified. And he told them to go wait. To go wait in, in Jerusalem until they're endued with power. He'd been crucified 50 days prior. But he visited them then for 40 days. And then 10 days after. 10 days after. So it's 40 days he visits them appears to many people. Then he ascends. 
And it's 10 days later that the Holy Spirit's poured out, which that had to be a long 10 days. Can you all hear me in the lobby? That had to be a long 10 days, a very long 10 days. And in actual fact, they're probably scared for their lives. They're probably hiding out in the upper room because they very plausibly figured that, well, they want to crucify us too. So they're in a 10-day prayer meeting. You ever been in a 10-day prayer meeting? You ever prayed for 10 days in one place? You ever, you ever been in a place for 10 days, just hung out day and night? That's what they're doing. And then on the 10th day, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God comes, not like these wimpy little fans, which we're hoping to move even more air by faith right now. The Spirit of God comes like a rushing, mighty win. What a meeting. The whole house where they were sitting was filled. Verse 2, then appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The reason Pentecostal churches are called Pentecostal churches is because they would always preach that message. That message would be preached over and over and over and over. You say, are we a Pentecostal church? Absolutely, yes, we are. We believe in the baptism of the Spirit. We believe in the outpouring of the Holy Ghost today. And in Topeka, Kansas, Charles Parham in the year 1901, at a Bible college, they were having an all-night prayer meeting, a watch night service, and they read that text, and this precious lady, and I can't remember her name in this Pentecostal history, but this is, this is our history. She said, you know, I believe if you guys lay hands on me right now, that I'm gonna get filled with the Spirit. They laid hands on her, she got baptized in the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And they began to lay hands on each other and they all began to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the current modern day outpouring started in 1901 and has swept the earth. The outpouring of the Spirit of God, the Pentecostal movement in the earth is growing faster than any other. You say, why is that? Because it is God's intention, God's plan to fill people, heal people, and set them free. Half-hearted, lukewarm, compromising Christianity is not getting it anymore. It never did, but, but people are fed up. Don't, people don't know which way to go. I thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank God for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I thank God for tongues. It's a powerful gift. In actual fact, they had linguists come. How many of you know what a linguist is? They had linguists come from the local university to listen to their tongues. This went on for days. And they came and listened and found they were speaking dialects of Chinese and different languages. So powerful was that move of God, and it spread. And that's the, that's the very beginnings of the Assemblies of God and some other denom den denominations as well. And from that started uh, the outpouring that took place in uh, a horse stable. You ever heard of it? Azusa Street. A one-eyed black man named William Seymour. I mean, I'm going to tell you, God's got a sense of humor. William Seymour had one eye. And he would, he heard, he wasn't, there was, there was racism. He wasn't even allowed to be in the classroom, but would sit outside with a notebook. You know, when you're hungry, it doesn't matter what people think of you. I'm not saying that's right. It's not right. But he was like, well, you call me whatever you want. Can I sit outside? He was so, call me a dog, the woman said. Just heal my daughter. When you're hungry and thirsty, you don't give a flip about what anybody thinks about you. When you're desperate for God to touch you, heal you, help you, that happened to me Sunday night. Just last Sunday night, I'm in Maui. 
It should have been falling out altogether because I was in the Hawaiian lines. It was amazing. I needed a touch from God. Conference is over. And I just said, oh, no. That's not enough. Lord, I need help. Jesus, I found myself going to the front weeping. Dr. Morocco's about to close, and he looks down at me. Gives me the old, what do you want? I said, I, I need prayer. He came down, laid hands on me, and the power of the Spirit of God touched me. Honestly, I'm not quite sure what all happened immediately after that. I just heard commotion as God began to touch me. And an interesting thing happened. I didn't remember it till right now. I would spend time on the floor. What are you talking about? You know, there are moments when God touches you that moves you beyond your, out of your regular soul, touches you in the spirit, and you might find yourself prostrate before the Lord. I say that right? I think so. I used to say, get out of here. I'm going over here. There I was, prostrate. Jesus help us. I spent a lot of time on that floor. I got saved in our church many, many years ago. And as I was on the floor, I, I ended up doing this thing that I would do all the way back then, but I, I don't think I've, I don't think it's happened recently. And I am weeping so hard, tears, hot tears running down my face. And I'd open my eyes a little bit and I, and I would see shooting lights and things just in the spirit. And it's really like a measure of his glory. And God was doing something in me. He was setting me free. He was lifting the burden. I'd been burdened. I was burdened. I needed God to lift that off of me. I needed God to lift. You know, you are not designed to carry God-sized burdens. All you're supposed to do is be a male man, a male girl. You're either a male woman or a male man. I don't know which one, but it sure ain't anything but that. Sorry, we have to clarify. God wants to touch you tonight, and He's going to, and He already is. Would you, would you just ask God to touch you tonight? Come on, say, Lord, touch me. I, I need help. Maybe it's your first time here. I'm really glad you're here. Maybe you've been here hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Don't ever get ho-hum in your walk with God. If you're bored, there's something wrong, and it's not with God. A bored Christian is a weak Christian. He said, I'm not a Christian at all. Well, I'm glad you're here, and I hope to remedy and fix that by the end of the service. The outpouring of the Spirit takes place, and the text that we read, Acts 3, there's a pretty grim situation. Peter and John in the hour of prayer, Acts 3, let's take a look at this. Some people don't have a time of prayer. They had a time of prayer. Do you have one? When is, your, when is your time of prayer? When is the time that you go and pray? And by the way, they're going together to a corporate prayer meeting. They're not just praying in their closet. I'm all for praying in your closet. I'm all for having your war room at home. I cleaned down my closet. I made my war room. Good, you make your war room. You get in your war room. You, you contend, you fight, you pray, glory. But also have a corporate time. And it's often not preached. The average pastor, did you know, prays for 20 minutes. 20 minutes. We wonder why there's not more release of the power of God upon a broken culture. Our dying, damned culture is getting worse. But I believe that God's raising up a people in Alaska and beyond. I believe that God is raising up a church within a church. I believe that God's raising up a remnant of hungry, thirsty people who know what they have. What do you mean who know what they have? I'm going to get there. This man has brought, verse 2, a certain man. We don't know his name. Lame from his mother's womb. He was deformed. He came out of his mother's womb deformed. Well, it's a good thing they didn't abort him. Because he got healed. And I'm pretty sure he would have said, I would prefer to live even lame than be dead. I just thought I'd throw that out. Lame from his mother's womb. He's carried daily. So he has his family. We don't know when he was able to begin his begging career. But they had, it was a form of welfare. They would, they would be able to beg. Amen. 
You go, little boy. <laughs> that easily could have been me if I was out there with a hot rod myself. So he's brought daily. He's got a family that cares for him. He's got someone that cares for him because he obviously can't walk because he's carried. And he's carried, to, he's carried to a gate called Beautiful. And at the gate called Beautiful, it is kind of unusual because he's brought there daily. Everybody say daily. So he's approximately 40 years old. It's Texas, 40 years old. So if you look at the life and ministry of Christ in the earth, it's plausible in fact, most likely, I would say absolutely would be the way I would say it. Jesus saw him, walked by him. For the years that Jesus walked the earth, he walked by that guy at some point and saw him sitting there. And yet, he didn't heal him. He chose not to heal him. And you got to ask the question, why? I don't know why. You know, why is oftentimes the wrong question? You can torment yourself by asking why. Why, God? Why, 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 why? I learned a long time ago that I'm not smart enough, and if he was to tell me, I probably wouldn't understand. I don't know how planets don't crash into each other. You want to know why? Stop asking why. Just serve God, love God, believe God. Leave the why with him. When you get to heaven, you'll figure it out. Why can torment Why did they die? Why did they get healed? Why? Did, why? Why? He walked past him. So crippled he had to be carried, and yet Jesus didn't heal him. Why not? We don't know. But we can say clearly that he needed the miracle, and Jesus could have given him the miracle right then, but he didn't, but he does here. After he ascended, after the outpouring of the Spirit. It's interesting if you look at the word called, the word here, beautiful, Greek word, Koine Greek. I, I, I didn't look it up tonight, but if, if my memory serves me well, which sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. It's horeas. It's a, it's a timing word. It's a word for, it means beautiful, but it, it, it means, it, this gate beautiful, it means that, how do I say it? That something happens so perfectly in time that it's beautiful. That's actually the meaning of the gate. And it's wonderful to see a man brought daily begging and at the right time gate. That is actually how you can say that. At the right time gate. At the beautiful gate. The time when it all comes together is beautiful. He gets healed. Oh, Jesus heals him, but he heals him through some disciples. Anybody ever been in a hopeless situation? You've been in something like you don't know what you're going to do? You're going to, how are you going to make it? How am I going to carry on? How am I going to keep, how can I make it? How can I make it? It is like that for this man, 40 years old. Peter and John have been filled with the Holy Spirit. This crippled man is healed. And the explanation of how he's healed is in verse 16. By faith in the name of Jesus. By what? by faith in the name of Jesus. I have to poke fun at the fact that uh, when he's healed, he begins leaping and walking and praising God. Sometimes in churches, there's a pressure to look good. There's a, pr there's a pressure to behave yourself. There's a pressure just like you know, don't, you know, you can do this, you do this maybe, but for God's sake, don't, 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 don't run. <laughs> Definitely don't, no leaping. I've said it before, but you know, when you're really hungry and you're really thirsty and you're really desperate, you really don't care what anybody thinks about you. When you're desperate and hungry, 
for God to touch you. Don't care if you're crying. You don't care if you have a tissue. And I mean, my nose is running. I'm in the altar. I want a tissue. This is called an altar area commonly. Jumping and leaping and praising God. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody receive their sight. A blind, blind eyes open. When you see that and that happens, let me just tell you, the blind people that then see, they, they don't care what you think about them. Not one bit. They're like, I can see! They freak out. How do you know? I've seen that. We've seen it here. We had a precious girl. She's in our youth group from time to time when she's able to be. She came here, I don't know, I want to say she's nine or so years old with a, some rare cancer years ago. They weren't a part of our church. They went to another church. God bless them wonderful. They heard that healing was taking place at King's. Go bring them over to King's. Maybe God can heal them. God can heal her. They brought her over, standing right here. We were in the midst of a 40-day fast. And we began to pray for people, and we got to this lady, this young girl, and we laid hands on her. They told us what the situation is. The parents were there. The friends that brought them were there. The ushers were there. We prayed for her. I felt like God touched her. I moved on. When I look back, I look back at that precious girl, and I don't know how else to tell you, but I saw an unseen hand. I saw the hand of God. I don't know each how to describe it. What does that look like? It looks like the hand of God. What, it, what happened? It, it was terrifying. It was amazing. And I saw God begin to touch this little girl and I thought, holy smokes, I, I've learned this. You just join in with what God's doing and God will do the rest. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless the Father's doing and I saw the Father doing something by the Holy Spirit. I went back, I laid hands on her. She flew out of my hands. The parrots went down on the ground. The, 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 the people that brought them went down on the ground. The ushers went down on the ground. And everybody's like in a heap, like a bunch of trees that fall over at once. And I was in shock. And the next thing I see, and this is what it looked like. I have a t-shirt on, so don't be scared. I see this under her shirt. Some of you were here. Who was here? Who saw that? Pastor Karen? It was a long time ago. It was a Sunday night, I think. And no, I think it was a Sunday night because it was kids, there's no kids' church. I think it was right here on a Sunday night, just like tonight. And I was so in shock that I looked and I said, uh, does anybody else see? I was freaked out. I said, does anybody else see that? And people started looking. I said, oh, oh, look, look, look at that. Does anybody, else? and we're looking at this hand that's going under this precious girl's shirt. Something's happening. She looked ash colored. Does anybody know what really sick and on the way to death looks like? Check your neighbor right now. You look good, so glory to God. You look good, praise God. Nobody, listen, if you came in this place tonight and you have a diagnosis of death from those who are practicing medicine, I have another diagnosis I wanna give you that God's able to help you. And the inoperable, and I'm thankful for modern medicine, Nurse Jan, and all of our nurses and all of our doctors. Thank God for modern medicine. But he's a great physician who guides physicians and does miracles. The girl sat up, and as I can recall, she said, Mommy, I feel better. And everybody's like, What? And I think she says, I'm hungry. She got up and she was healed. She was, all the color restored, the ash is gone. She completely healed. He said, well, that, that was for her. Yeah, well, maybe God has something for you. This man who's 40 years old is brought there. I don't know what you've been struggling for 40 years. Some of you aren't 40 years old. I don't know what you've been struggling for your teenage years. I don't know what you're struggling with as a child. I don't know what you're struggling with in your marriage. I just know this, the one who's able to heal you, the one who's able to set you free, the one who's able to raise the dead and open blind eyes and deaf ears and pull a coin out of a fish's mouth, his name is Jesus and faith in his name releases miracle power, releases miracle power, releases miracle power. Faith in his name releases miracle power. I said faith in his name.
releases miracle power. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Something. Great haircut. Go and lift your hands to heaven. Faith in his name releases miracle power. Faith is action. Faith is action. Faith is acting on God's word. Faith in his name. Action on the name of Jesus releases miracles. Many people don't see miracles because they're not willing to do their part. And I'm so grateful for the sovereign moves of his spirit where he comes and touches us even though we're dumb as a box of rocks and not paying attention. Then he comes and just helps us. How many of you had a few moments like that? I'm convinced he saved us over and over again even when we were aware and when we weren't. Faith that comes through him, the text says. Wow. I want to give you just a few points tonight about releasing your faith, releasing the power of Pentecost, releasing the power of the Spirit, releasing miracle signs and wonders. Oh, in your home. Now, I'm glad you're here and the place is relatively full on a Sunday night in summer in Alaska where you could be riding a four-wheeler or at the lake or something until midnight and it still seem like it's noon. But you're in church, which means you want God. You're hungry for God, and you're wanting to have fellowship with believers, and you're here, and I'm so glad you are. I want to give you some points tonight to help you see the power of Pentecost put on display. Because what we need in this community is not more opioids. We need less, and we need God's power. And the reason that people are stuck on opioids is because the power of God has not been put on display to the degree that people would get out off of them. But it's happening. Come on, somebody say it's taking place. Yes, it is, because you're going to step up. I'm stepping up too. Look at verse 4 and 5 of Acts chapter 3. And fixing his eyes on them, on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention expecting to receive something from them. The importance of expectancy. Some of you were here tonight because you said, oh, oh, yes, Sunday night, that's the Netflix fire, man. You need to come, you need to check it out. Yeah, pastor's back, it's gonna be good as Pentecost. So you came, maybe with a glimmer of hope that God could do something for you tonight. I commend you. You should come to every service like that. You know, we, we've had, and I don't know what you think about him, uh, Benny Hinn, we've had him come to our, our cathedral in Maui. And as we get established on the hill, he's open to coming there. We've got Jesse DePlantis coming. We've got John, uh, John um, Heggie coming. We've got different guests. We couldn't fit him in here. We just, we, just, we just, can't, just can't fit him. You have him, and it'll be mayhem in the parking lot. We have, we have room over there to do those things. We will be doing those things. It's amazing, Pastor Kersey. You remember when Benny Hinn came during the times that we were there? You know, Christians, I've seen some Christians do some stuff, man. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I was serving with Pastor Karen. I came like an hour early, set, set up my seat, you know, put my Bible, my stuff, and then we hustled around and did greeting and different, did different things. Then it's time, to, it's time to find your seat and get to worship. And I get, I go back to my seat, and there's this guy sitting in my seat. I'm like, uh, oh, I, my Bible was there. He says, yeah, it's right there. I said, well, uh, that, 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 that was my seat. He said, well, it's not your seat anymore. I said, oh. And I wanted to just... I wanted to just, I wanted to minister to him. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, rip me off. I don't like getting ripped off. And I, I was only mostly saved back then. I was like, oh yeah? You will take my seat, huh? You will take my seat. <laughs> and I walked away and I'm like, okay, God bless you. You know, I'm really like dropping an F-bomb, but saying God bless you. F is forgiveness, forgiveness bomb. 
Come on, what's wrong? You guys, you guys, man. So I did, I dropped an F-bomb, I forgave him. And then there's no seats, cause it's Benny Hinn time. People came from all over the place. They flew in, they came from the, the, the the mainland to Hawaii, they came from Oahu, they came from all the outer islands. Benny Hinn, people came to get healed, to get touched. Can I tell you what the expectancy level was? It was gigantic. People were like, it's my night. You know how many miracles happen? So many, too many to count. And I think back at going to Oahu and Benny Hinn at the Blaisdell. We went early and we went there and there was like two hours of worship before Benny Hinn even showed up. That place was filled with the, I don't care what you, I know, I can discern the Spirit of God. I'm telling you, it was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And as I'm, I'm worshiping and moving around, I had people coming to me because I was wearing a suit and I guess I looked like an associate of Benny Hinn or something. I don't know what the deal was, but I had people coming to me, heal my son, heal my son. I'm like, Oh uh, yeah, I don't really work here. Heal him. They were so desperate. So what I ended up doing, I, I, I went back to my seat so bankrupt. I laid hands, you remember that? I laid hands on these babies and prayed for people and some people were getting touched, but I'm talking real miracles like twisted limbs and I'm praying and nothing's happening and they're crying and they're like, pray again. Broken parents who had been through the, the ends of the medical system to try to get a miracle. And there they are with me, expecting to receive a miracle. I left, I went back to my seat feeling so bankrupt. I'm like, man, a few people got touched, but I didn't see many miracles. I said, oh God, I, I, I need more of you. If you were here and you are here, God, you could do something. But I was so brought to the end of my faith and realizing, I need more of you, God, to operate through me. It brought me to a place not of hopelessness, but a place of faith despair to say, God, you can anoint me to another level. I want to be used by you. That's the way these guys were. That's the way they were. They had expectancy, this expectancy, the law of expectancy. If you want to see miracle power, you have to raise your expect, expect it, believe for it. Imagine it, hope for it, envision it, work yourself up. Do you remember what it was like when you went to bed Christmas morning, you came back, oh, it's Christmas morning. You raced down and snatched that stocking off of the chimney and ripped into that thing. You said, oh, I'm Jewish. All right, whatever, you got your dreidel out and you like really, I don't know what you would be expecting for. <laughs> Expectancy is the seedbed of miracles. Expectancy is a, is a soil of which God releases his power. So if you're apathetic, that would be the opposite of that. Well, whatever, I've been in church for years and uh, you know, I've seen a couple things, but I'm just here because my wife wanted me to come. Well, I don't feel much of his presence. You're dead, that's why. You're like a stump. <laughs> Pastor Karen told me to say that. You need to be healed. You need to be set free from your lethargic, half-hearted Christianity and build expectancy. Read the word, feed on miracles, and watch God do amazing things. In Acts chapter 14, the law of expectancy, the importance of expectancy. We're giving you some principles or some points from this text on how to see miracle power put on display. Number one, expect it in your life and through your life. Everybody say, I'm gonna expect it in my life and through my life. All right, you cultivate that. Acts 14 verse eight, there in Lystra was a man who was lame. He'd been that way from birth, he'd never walked. Verse nine, he listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. And he called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. He saw that he had faith. Now, I don't know if you know what that means, but there's some, I can see when I preach, I can see it now. Some of you don't care. You're looking forward to going to Red Robin. 
Others of you are like really hungry and you want God to touch you, do something. And I've looked out over congregations over the years and you can see people that are leaning in and be like, come on, God, God, do something. Oh, there, there's something different in the heart of someone who longs for God to do miracles. And it is in that environment that the power of God is put on display. There in, in Acts 2, they were gathered in one accord. The one accord. They weren't thinking about Red Robin. Half of them weren't thinking about going to Red Robin to get the, the Red Robin burger. When the seasoned fries. Oh, and if you ask for them without salt, they actually come hot. So you just should try that. And I'm going to get myself a strawberry freckle soda. Gosh, it's hot. Oh, it's so hot. When's he going to end? You wonder why you don't have more manifestation of power in your life. If you have a, a lack of expectancy, you have to cultivate that. I'm going to stay on this point for a second. We were on an airplane years ago. And I, I, does anybody remember your first airplane ride? You know, now they lock captains behind doors. And like, I went to go use the restroom in the first class. I walked up through there to use the facility, but apparently the captain was in it. And, and uh, Broomhilda, I don't, I don't know, Helga, I don't know, some really strong lady that was scary, stood there and said, the captain stood there. I said, oh, sorry. She says, return to your seat. I said, yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Broomhilda. But it used to be that... that when you walk in, they, they would even give you tours of the cockpit. Did anybody, did anybody remember when your first flight? And they would, it would give you a set of wings. Did anybody ever get those? I think they still have it. And if you ever seen a little kid get on a big jet for the first time, you know a kid that really likes jets? They are, their eyes are darting back and forth. They're like, it's a jet, it's a jet. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, the flight attendants can pick them off. You, you can see them. They're like, oh, here comes the first timer. And they're like, hey, it's hey, hey, hey. your first time on a plane? Uh, uh, uh. You want to see the cockpit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to see the cockpit. I want to see the cockpit. Oh, okay, come on, let's go. And, and, and they bring him in, and the kid's just like. And they give him a set of wings. Can I tell you something? I never get on a plane like that now. I'm like, bless the plane. Lord, is it going to stay in the Good, thank you, Jesus. I get on the plane. I do with every plane I get on. I sit down, like, sometimes I'm a, <clears throat> and, then, and then I wake up, we're already in the air. It's not like, oh, we used to hold hands for takeoff all the time. Not anymore. I've been on so many airplanes. I've been on so many airplanes. I've had panic attack on airplanes. I was pinned on the window seat with two people that were eating a lot of snacks. And I was about really way overweight. I couldn't breathe. Even when I sat down, I couldn't breathe. So I sit down. I had to like breathing through a straw because I had such a big gut back then. And I had a panic attack. Anyway, that's another message. When you come to church, it should not be like me and Pastor Karen getting on an airplane. We've been on thousands of flights over the years, I think. Is that an exaggeration? If you want the exact amount of flights, just ask Pastor Karen, she'll tell you. We've been on a lot of flights. <laughs> We've been on a lot of flights. So when we get on a flight, it's just kind of like, we do our little routine. I get my little, head, my little headphones out. I do my thing. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for your intervention right now. Oh, intervene, God. Save lives. No fires. When that little, a little boy got on the plane to see a cockpit for the first time, his mind blew up. Why? Because he was excited. He was expecting. When you come to church, be like the little boy. Be like the little girl. Be somebody who's like, oh, man. Ooh. We saw that in Benny Hinn meetings, and I see it today, but not with everybody. Cultivate that. If you want to see miracle, you want to see the power of Pentecost put on display, cultivate expectancy. The second thing I see in this text as we move along here is found in verse 6. Silver and gold I do not have. You know, 
We're going to raise this 1.6 million and change. It will happen. Let me just tell you, there's no dollar figure. There's no amount of money that can raise the dead. There's no amount of money that can heal cancer. There's no amount of money that can, that can set the captives free. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of paid counseling and psychotherapy. There's no amount of money that can heal the human heart. Nothing but God. God can. God can heal the sick. God can set the captives free. God can loose you from your bonds. He can loose you and set you free. I love what he says. Silver and gold. I don't have any change. I don't have any gold. I don't have any money. He didn't need money. He needed his legs. I got to say that if you think money will solve all your problems, if, late breaking news today, it won't. You know, oh no, yes it will. No, it won't. It won't solve all your problems. You need money to live in this world. You need provision. But no amount of money can heal a broken soul. No amount of money can set the captives free. No amount of money can heal a drug addict. No amount of money can heal your marriage. No amount of money will get you into heaven. Silver and gold, I do not have, but what I do have, what I do have, what I do have, I give you. The church, let me say Peter here, he knew what he had. What I do have, I give you. The church has forgotten what they have. And you might have forgotten who lives on the inside of you. Deity inside of humanity. We are his house. We are his temple. The Nios is the church, the dwelling place of God. But he lives on the inside of me. John G. Lake, looking in the mirror, used to put on a suit every day and say something to the effect of God lives inside this man wearing a suit. God lives in me, and wherever I go, God is going. And he would go, and he would lay hands on the sick, and he would see people delivered. Without internet, without cell phones, without email, without all the modern technology, he planted 500 churches in five years, if I remember that correctly, in Africa. He stood over a, over a valley in a loincloth, because I guess that's what you wore back then. I don't know. I read it. He's wearing he wear their, their native wear. Thank God we don't have to do that. Amen, Pastor Kirsten. And he waved his hand over the valley, and it is said that every single person in that valley got healed. Some of you can't get past a loincloth. I'm telling you. <laughs> silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Come on, say, buddy, say, I got some stuff. Come on. I got it. I got it. I got it, I got it. Something about the Holy Ghost. Got it in my hands. I got it in there, I got it. Or you either got it or you don't. I can't explain it, says the, the song. I can't explain it, but I got it in my hands. I got it in my heart. I got it in my walk. I got it in my talk. I got it, I got it. The church has forgotten what God has given us. God has given us the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. You want to see miracle power? You want to see Pentecost put on display in your life, in you and through you? You want to see that? Cultivate expectancy and then remind yourself, biblically, understand that the power of God will take residence on the inside of you. Now, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and some of you are not saved, but you're going to be by the end of tonight. He comes to live on the inside of you, but there's something different called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is what Pentecost is about. And it needs to be preached, it needs to be modeled, it needs to be taught. You need to be filled. As a cucumber would be transformed through a solution, how many of you like pickles? A cucumber is transformed through a solution and, and made a pickle. That is the picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is upon you, but he's worked all the way through you. He's, listen, a cucumber gets transformed. A cucumber is okay. A good dill pickle, buddy. Yes. 
Come on, somebody, like anybody like pickles beside me? I've noticed that spirit-filled people like pickles. Because you're supposed to be one. There's an expression about alcoholics that say, well, he's pickled now. What does that mean? That means he's drunk so, he's had so much alcohol it's through his whole system, and he's just, he's soaked. He's soaked in it. It's in his brain. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit upon you, in you, flowing through you, taking up residence on the inside of you. God wants to pickle you. Come on, somebody say, God wants to pickle me. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you. I think it's a big problem that many people don't know what they have. You have something, and that something's name is the Holy Spirit. He's not an it. He's not a dove. It's the power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Knowing the power of the kingdom of God is at work through you. You need to know that. You need to think about it. Meditate on it. Pray. I got to tell the story years ago of when Brother Rodney Howard Brown came, and he, he wants to come up too. And we'll have room for him in our new facility. That night in 1995, especially on that Friday night, I was in a week of meetings, and on that Friday night, Dr. James Morocco came to pray for people. Rodney Howard Brown told him, I think he was in his 30s, and he told him, you're going to pray for people tonight. Dr. Morocco said, well, praise God. Dr. Morocco thought he was going to be his sidekick. In other words, Rodney prays for people, and Dr. Morocco's right here, and he's sort of facilitating. But not that night. That night, Dr. Morocco got called out by Rodney Howard Brown, and he said, go ahead and pray for everybody. And Pastor Morocco tells the story that he thought, well, that's it. My ministry is over. Another, no, nothing's going to happen. He was so freaked out. He said he walked down. He's like, Lord, you've got to do something. You have to do something. He got to this step. And he got to this step. There's a lady in front of him. By the time he took the next step and put his hand out, she flew through the air 10 to 15 feet back. I was there. I saw it. And the power of God hit that church. There wasn't hardly anybody standing by the end of that thing. And I remember just seeing Dr. Morocco slunched over. And then he just put his head on Dr. On Rodney Howard Brown's chest. And I thought, I was weeping and crying. The sound of of, of heaven and people being touched and saved and healed. It was astounding. I'm convinced that meetings like that don't happen anymore as often as God would like them to because there's ministers, there's pastors that people aren't willing to just wait on the Lord. Amen. They're not willing to wait, not willing to... See, it's a choice right now. What do you mean? Oh, I, I could close. It's 7.15. I wouldn't mind going to Red Robin too. On one hand. On the other hand, how is it that you have two to three hundred people here in church on a Sunday night in Alaska when you could be doing anything else? You could be fishing right now, but you're here. Why is that? Because many of you are expectant. You're hungry. And you need God. You long for Him to touch you and to heal you and to help you. We need a move of the Spirit of God. We don't... There's great teaching, great leadership out there. We have that too, by the grace of God. But I want to contend. I want to press in for another level of the power of God. Would you go there with me? Would you begin to come to service, maybe more expected, maybe skip a meal before service? Come maybe partially fasted, that kind of thing. Come, hungry, expecting to receive, no matter who's preaching, no matter who's here. In a moment, we're going to take communion, and then we're going to pray for some people, and people are going to get touched, people are going to get healed. Before we receive communion, I want to be sure that you're right with God. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, won't you do it tonight? Won't you give your heart to Christ for the first time? You've never repented of your sin. You, oh, yeah, you believe in God, perhaps. Okay. Well, the Bible says that even, de even demons believe. And the book of James says that. If you've never given your heart to Christ, you've never repented of your sin and asked Jesus to come in and forgive you and to come in to take up residence, you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved, which means you shall be forgiven. But saved is sozo in the Greek, the original language. 
you shall be saved. It's forgiven. It's not only forgiven, it's healed. It's made whole. I'm saved. I've been saved for a long time. But it's just as fresh and new to me today. It's driving to church this morning. Realizing that everything I have, all that I have, all that's the stuff I have, means nothing. It means nothing. I'm driving my car, taking, it all belongs to Him. As we positioned ourselves to so largely this morning, and we did. We were weeping. And I said to, I said to you, I said to Pastor Karen, I said, we had nothing. We were broken. We were lost. And he saved us. Oh, and he healed us. He set our feet upon a, a rock in a firm place. He taught me that all other ground is sinking sand. He taught me that, that apart from him, I can do nothing. He taught me that, that with God, I can, be, I can walk in satisfaction and fulfillment. But apart from him, I'll bear forth no fruit. He's been leading and guiding me. I just had a fresh awakening. Somebody, somebody said, well, how long have you been saved? I love what my mama said years ago. Because people used to say, well, how long have you been saved? Well, I've been saved 20 years. How about you? Uh, uh, not that long. Because there's a pride. How long have you been saved? I know people that say for 20 years, they're dry, dead, twice pulled up from the roots, got no fire, no power, don't lay hands on anything, walk around bitter, angry, mad they got a tithe, mad they're asked to give, ticked off, their kids hate them. You say for 20 years, I don't think you're saved maybe. Smile at me, I'm preaching good tonight. If you've lost touch with that, you need to recommit your life to the Lord. So my mother used to say, when somebody said, well, how, when, she, when she sensed that, when she felt that, she would say, well, today, honey, I got saved today. That's a good thing. I got saved today, today. <laughs> Woo! Every head bowed, every eye closed. You see, that's me. I'm, I don't know where I'm going when I die. Jesus came so that you can be forgiven, so that heaven would be your home when you die. But he also came so that you could have life abundant, that you could have real life right here right now life true life with people power with purpose every man every woman every child has purpose all of us have a purpose but you'll never find it until you receive christ receive him i implore you i plead with you on christ's behalf to be reconciled to god intercessors praying you've heard the message before but you hardened your heart i pray that as i as I speak to you right now, I push you right out of your apathy. Give your heart to Christ. You'll never regret it. The reason you live, the reason you're breathing is to give Him glory. His hand is upon you. That's why your heart is still beating. He's wooing you. He's calling you through my voice tonight to be reconciled, to be forgiven, to be healed, to be made whole. You say, that's me. I want to get right with Jesus. Or maybe, maybe you're convicted that you lost your fire and you need to recommit. Listen, if you're not as on fire as you used to be, it's not God's fault and it's not my fault. It's not the church's fault. I had somebody tell me, I'm not going to church here. I'm not getting fed. I said, that's on you, homie. I think I called him slick, actually. I said, that's on you, slick. That's not on me. There's something wrong with you. I don't know. If God's leading you to go somewhere else, go for it. We'll bless you. But don't say, I'm not getting fed. That's the stupidest, most ignorant thing I've ever heard. There is food being served up here from heaven every single time we meet. From the, from the crawlers to the walkers and the children's church and the, and the youth and the youth and the young adults and the adults. The power of God is put on display. The word of God is being preached. People are being saved. Don't tell me you're not getting fed. If you're not getting fed, your, your lips might be sewn shut spiritually give your heart to Christ right now or recommit you say that's me on the count of three slip your hand up gonna get right with God want to be forgiven want Jesus to come into your heart for the first time or in recommitment on the count of three slip your hand up one two three do it right now God bless you God bless you God bless you God bless you my 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 God bless you praise God thank you sweetheart I see that hand I see that hand thank you leave your hand high until I acknowledge it and look straight at me God bless you thank you sir God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Over on this side, you want to get right with God. First time or recommitment. God bless you. All right, I see all those hands. Thank you. 
Would you stand up on your feet with me all across this place? And repeat after me, say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place, to rise again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin and come into my life. Come into my heart. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me new. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Now say this. Say, God, set my heart on fire and fill me with your Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name.